Okay, welcome everybody and thank you for attending our webinar. Today we are going to get an update on Silvercrest Metals and talk about the silver market. Silvercrest is a precious metals exploration and development company headquartered in Vancouver, British Columbia, that is focused on new discoveries, value-added acquisitions, and targeting production in Mexico's historic precious metals district. The company's top priority is getting a high-grade silver mine in Sonora, Mexico on production this summer. Our speaker today is uh, Christopher Ritchie, the company's president. He has over 15 years of financial experience in resource-based capital markets, including investment banking, marketing, corporate strategy, network, and risk management. He earned a BA from Miami University in Ohio in 1997 and went on to get an MBA in finance in the year 2000. Uh, Mr. Ritchie spent just just under three years in risk management at Martian McLennan and Liberty International before he moved into trading and institutional equity sales at UBS, Canaccord Financial, and National Bank Financial. Uh, during the past eight years, uh, through National Bank Financial and Canaccord Genuity, uh, he has been a key financial advisor and partner to the precious to the previous and current Silvercrest teams through the development of Santa Alina the sale of Silvercrest Mines to First Majestic Silver Corp and three financing for Silvercrest Metals. Now I will turn it over to Chris Ritchie and I will return for Q&A after his presentation. So Chris, take it away. Thanks everyone. Uh, I appreciate everyone's time and energy today. I know there's a lot going on in the markets and, and in the world, um, but it was a, a good little intro to sort of give a sense of, of big picture context for the type of company that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, anyone who's paying attention to the resource space and energy and precious metals, there's a bunch of big dynamics worth noting. One obviously is, you know, they're trading at large discounts to historic norms, which makes it a really interesting opportunity. There's a scarcity aspect of high quality projects these days, um, which we're definitely in that category. That's probably one of the biggest takeaways. We're one of the top two or three highest grade projects in the world. And high grade in mining typically corresponds to margins. And margins typically correspond to resilience. And again, if there's one thing every company wants these days is the ability to be resilient in a really tough, challenging macro situation. And we're on the cusp of some pretty big changes as the Fed uh, has been living off the punch bowl of uh, you know, lower rates and printing money and turning that printing money into a political tool. So we're navigating those challenges is, is difficult. And part of our strategy is to create a vehicle that can navigate those challenges and be asymmetric. And being asymmetric means being resilient um, and say, at the same time providing upside that is greater than the norm. If it's just going to be a coin flip, on, on commodity prices going up and down, um, we might as well go to Vegas and at least we'll get free beverages. Um, so again, we're trying to do something quite different here and it's the asset here that really does a lot of the work for us. The reason we're having this chat today and the timing is appropriate is that we just put out a construction update for our project. And there's a typical life cycle that goes with all resource companies and it's the timing's a little different from energy and, 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 and mining in that the typical mine takes about 20 years to go from you know, buying a piece of property, doing the work, drilling it, you know, seeing if you've got enough silver and gold in order to actually decide to go build something. And then you gotta go build it. And then within that, you've gotta raise money and you've gotta dilute the company and you've gotta try your best not to give away all your, all your, all your shares and ownership stake. So what you get from us right now is we're coming to the end of a lot of the really hard parts. There's still hard parts in front of us, but we're coming to the end of the highest risk portions of the story. And you can see here on the slides that the typical mine takes about 20 years to go from first drill hole to cash flow. And over on the right side of the page, you'll see that dotted box. We're gonna be seven. And, and in Dan's intro, he talked about the previous Silvercrest and, and the current Silvercrest. One of the unique things is the previous silver crest, that Santa Elena mine, that mine's 25 kilometers away from this mine. So it's a really good analogy of how we, we do business. And Eric, our CEO, was, is, you know, he's a bit of a Jedi in terms of he bought the Santa Elena mine for about four or five million bucks. Um, did all the drilling. He's an engineer. He's a, he's a geologist. Um, I was in the finance world helping them get the money. And they got it up and running. He built it on time, on budget. 
which is very significant as it relates to us today. Um, and then post-production grew it further. And that's a big part of what we do is we're trying to get it, you know, stop the dilution, build it for the smallest amount of capital possible and then scale. And that, that's a big, that's a big difference. A lot of other mines have different types of deposits where you, you need to drill it forever and get economies of scale before the economics make sense. And it's quite different. So that mine, you know, built on time on budget, operated it for five years, sold it in late 15. And if anyone remembers late 15 from a silver and gold perspective, it was really bad. And our asset at the time was low cost. We had a really good balance sheet, which meant we were resilient. And we stood the, stood the, withstood the pressure in that time. And another company came along and bought it. And some people said, oh, you're crazy. Because the company that bought it went up 600% in the next nine months. They said, oh, you sold too early. Well, part of our thinking was, no, they bought us with shares of their company. And we ended up getting 23% of, of that company in the transaction. So our shareholders got to rotate into a, a highly levered company at the perfect time in the cycle. And they got to participate in that 600% move in the following nine months. So one of the biggest things that we can now only talk about, given that we're exiting construction shortly and, and exiting this high risk phase, is what kind of vehicle we have. So I think one of the things for, that Lindsay, to, to go back to where the balance sheet is, it's always a good starting point, especially in resource companies. People always want to know if you're going to raise more money and you're going to dilute and put pressure on the share price. So where we sit today, you'll see the cash balance. We have 177 million U.S. of cash. Uh, we put out a news release uh, last week talking about where we're sitting on the construction side of things. And where we sit now um, is $43 million left to spend on the project. Within that $43 million, we have um, $6.3 million of contingency. Um, we have uh, $9 million that is fixed price, meaning we have a third party building our mill. And if there's an overrun or problem on the scope that they're engaged in, they pay for it, okay? So what I'm trying to get to here, there's about $30 million that we can screw up. There's $30 million of work that, that Silvercrest is responsible for. And if you do a 20 or 30% overrun on that 30 million, you get to six to 9 million bucks. And what I'm trying to provide there is context that we do have 177 million. And so far we're actually ahead of schedule. I mean, the, the schedule called for us to be 79% complete, we're 86. So, so far so good. Um, our COO, he's, he's also built the largest gold mine in Canada. And a little fun fact there, it's a totally different type of operation, but they move more material in, in one and a half days than we do in a year. So it's a much, this is a much smaller operation. He's done this numerous times. Eric, our CEO, has done this numerous times. Um, so there's a high degree of confidence from our technical team. I get to do the easy work. Above and beyond that 43 million, there's other expenses to running the business. We run a camp at site, and that camp is, you know, COVID related. And we didn't want COVID, uh, the infection, to come in with our employees coming in from all over the country for shift work. So we built a camp on site. So they kind of go directly to site after doing a PCR test. So it's good for safety. It's good for community relations, but it costs money. Um, so that as a cost, there's a cost for GNA and overhead. Um, we've pulled 90 million of debt. So we're paying the debt as we go. And that debt as we go, um, we don't want it compounding on us. Um, we're also growing. One of the best things that about our story is that the 95 million silver equivalent ounces that we have today, and that's about 45% gold, 55% silver. We blend those together to get a 95 million number based on a silver equivalent. It's cost us less than $1 per ounce to find that. And in mining terms, that's a pretty darn good number. So if you can take something out of the ground for eight, nine bucks and find it for a dollar, it, it goes to margins, okay? Um, above and beyond that, in Mexico, they have what's called uh, IVA, and that's a VAT tax. So what that means is they charge you 16% goods and services. Um, they do give it back to you, but it takes time. I mean, it's probably a year and a half to two years. That number for us in 2021 and 22 was $50 million. 
So again, when you add up all those additional costs above and beyond the 43, it's about 70 to 80 million. Some of them are subjective, meaning the drilling. And if we really needed to get a bank to sort of give us 90 cents on the dollar for those uh, IVA money coming back, we could do so. But the main point I'm trying to make here is that if you take the 40 and the 70 or 40 and the 80, we still have about $55 million of additional capital uh, available to us. And we still have another $30 million of debt available to us. So again, in the mining space, it's really important to know that we're finally coming through these major challenges with COVID, uh, supply chain issues, all the things that the, these last couple of years have had, and we're getting right near the tag end there with a nice buffer. Um, if you can show the production slides, Lindsay, I, I wanna kind of correlate that to what the next you know, 12, 24 months looks like in terms of opportunity, right? Because this transition from risk to opportunity is, is, is now something we can talk about given we're coming to the tag ends of the construction. So if you look at the bottom right, you'll see FS. And what that FS is, stands for is feasibility study. So this is the work that needs to do to say, well, here's the drilling, but is it done to the high degree of confidence? Is the information good enough? Is it high quality enough? Have you done your engineering work? How much money is it going to take to build the project? You know, where are you going to mine your material from every year? to come up with a plan. And that mine plan gets condensed into what you see on the screen here. And what you do is you can apply different prices to the plan and see what the economics are. And what you'll see in the bottom there, you'll see numbers like IRR and payback. And the IRR stands for the internal rate of return. And basically what that is, is what's your annual return based on your cost? So our, our IRR is, is over 50% per year essentially. And below that, you'll see a payback period. And that payback period, depending on what price you wanna use, is about a year at you know, lower prices than today. So if we can pay back all of our capital within a year and we're on time on budget, you get a really strong sense that this is a highly economic project, okay? To change that into a cash flow scenario, I mean, recall that we've got that 55 million, uh, hopefully in our back pocket. And we've also got that 50 million of tax that gets remitted to the government and comes back to us. That's in the other back pocket. Um, we also want to look at cash flows. And we think it's prudent to use $1,500 gold and $19 silver to illustrate the resilience of our project here. And then blue bar is what is what gets corresponded to those those numbers in the chart on the left. And what that shows is that in our first full year, which is 2023, I mean, this year, 2022, we're just going to be finishing construction in Q2 and starting to ramp up and, you know, iron out the wrinkles. But what we'll have there is approximately 160 million of project level free cash flow. And again, I, I emphasize that word project level because that's not corporate level, okay? And to get to corporate level, you have to subtract your, subtract your g &A. you're running the company, your overhead, your rent, the coffee machine. You have to subtract your debt servicing, right? And any other costs that you wanna do. So growth, if we wanna spend money on drilling and whatnot, that, that comes into that number. We don't have exact numbers for 2023, but if you wanted to assume somewhere between 35 and $45 million, um, that, that would be reasonable as a, as a starting point. So if you subtract 40-ish million from the 160, you're left with you know, $120 million, hopefully in your other front pocket. So you've got the 55 in the one bag pocket, you've got your 50 from your, your tax coming back from the government at some point, and hopefully you know, we can execute well and this you know, 110, 120 million in the front pocket all adds up to a, a pretty nice number as we transition from high risk to a sustainable, stable cash flowing company, right? And all of this again comes at what we believe or hope to be conservative prices. If you go to the left and look at the, the silver bar on that chart and you look at the, the price assumptions that go into that silver bar, that's a gold price under $1,300 an ounce. And that's a silver price below $17. And you can still see below that our payback period is just over one year. So what this is telling you, this is a really low capital intensive project with really robust free cash flow numbers.
okay? And that, that silver bar on the chart shows that we still would have about 140 million of project level free cash flow. So again, subtract your other money, but we're probably not doing much drilling uh, at those prices, right? So as a, as a free cash flow number, if you look at our market cap today, I'm not sure exactly where we are, but I think we're probably around $1.2 billion. Um, you're close to a 10% free cash flow yield if we can execute and 2023 goes this way. Um, a really fun number is if you look at the one on the right side of the page and you see 1950 gold and, and silver over 27, a little bit higher today, but not, not remotely out of, uh, of reach. You see that that project level free cash flow is over 200 million. So what are the key things to kind of put at what, what does a eight to 12% free cash flow yield like, look, look like compared to other things? Well, right now the federal government has a, a fed fund rates of close to zero, you know, putting money in a 10 year bond is less than 2%. And the big number that people need to, to, to get comfortable with is called real rates. And that real rate is what it does is it takes the rate of inflation and compares that to, you know, a 10 year government bond. And right now with inflation running at seven, eight, nine, 10%, depending on what numbers you want to look at, that basically means you're losing purchasing power to the tune of seven, eight, nine percent. So if you get a bond giving you one and a half percent, you know, and inflation's running at seven and a half percent, you subtract the one and a half from seven and a half percent, you're losing six percent of your purchasing power per year holding your money in US dollars. I mean, Canadian pesos are even worse, but but globally, you're seeing money printing has become a political tool and something that's been done during COVID uh, as a means to, to support the economy. But it means we've pulled forward all sorts of demand. It means we eventually have to pay back this debt or monetize it. So what you get with gold and silver is a, a hedge against that inflation. You get protection and get against that reduction of purchasing power by holding your money in fiat. So if you can get a gold and silver company that has the potential to provide you with a really, really robust free cash flow yield, really, really strong resilience at lower commodity prices as well. Um, and at the same time, we have a fair bit of growth in front of us in terms of more veins to drill off, other properties to, to explore hopefully all to come back and go into the facility that we're just getting to the tag ends of construction on, right? Once that ca capital is sunk, any new tons and ounces we, we hopefully will find, you know, drop to the bottom line uh, a lot quicker. So this is the first time we've been able to, to really speak to what's next in the story because everyone's been so focused on um, the construction. And if you go to the previous slide, Lindsay, I want to talk about some of the risks and, and opportunities in the next, you know, 12, 24 months uh, that's quite unique to us. So in, in a mine, when you're building a mine, there's two major components or three. Well, one, you have to find the ounces. And again, we're one of the top two or three highest grade mines in the world. If you had a silver mine, and actually I'll jump around a little bit, Lindsay, maybe go to the slide with the, uh, the different silver assets on it. And, and this is probably a better starting point for people a little less familiar with this space. These are the top 12 mines in the world for silver. And ours is in the blue column there, sort of in the middle. The circles there show the grade. And what that means is it's 879 grams per ton. So in mining, every ton you dig up, you have to pay for. And the real economics come from how much gold and silver are you taking out of each ton? So again, that's where this grade typically corresponds to margins. So you can see here where the second highest grade of, in the world uh, of mines here. And again, so that means it's a scarce high grade asset. If you have you know, grade that's in the three, 400 gram a ton range, these are fantastic high grade projects. But we're, with silver at $23, your costs are probably in the high teens. OK, the average cost based on some of the analyst estimates are in the 16 to 20 dollars per ounce range. So with silver at 23, there's not much margin. Our all in sustaining costs should be sub nine dollars an ounce. All right. So, again, and coming back to that resilience point here, 
So to show where we are today, coming to the tag end of construction, we've got a very high grade project with a good mine life, with a lot of resilience and a lot of free cash flow. So again, maybe jump back to the other slide, Lindsay, to talk about the, the next set of risks and opportunities and things that we've done that are unique that are worth looking at as we kind of look at the next uh, year or two. There's three parts of the mine. You know, again, I just talked about the asset itself and the grade and the high quality there. The second part is the underground, which you have to build your tunnels and you have to make sure you've created enough infrastructure that every single day you can put the right amount of tons into the mill. The third part's the mill. You got to build that mill and make sure that that's ready to receive those tons, process those rocks and kick out those nice you know, bars that are part gold, part silver before you ship them off to the refinery. Um, and one of the things that was extremely unique we started our, those underground tunnels and, and to create that underground infrastructure three years ago. We did it before we had all the final information about the economics of the project. And we were able to do that because we already knew it was highly economic. We just didn't know how economic. So that confidence we had uh, allowed us to start that work typically two to three years before anybody else would. And what that means is we've got 17 kilometers of underground development already complete. Our COO Pierre got to design the mill while touching and feeling the actual rock. And that means he can design that process that directly corresponds with the type of rock you're dealing with, as opposed to what you see with a, a drill hole. So that type of de-risking for designing that plant cannot be overstated enough. Um, also, you can see from the gold bars on the chart on the right, when we start our mill, we're gonna have about nine months of stockpiles sitting on the surface. And what that means is that rock's already on the ground. So getting that material into the mill for us for the next 24 months is an amazing de-risking opportunity for us. And a lot of that material has been sitting there for a hundred years. We, this mine used to be in production from 1880 to 1930. Next time anyone's in New York, um, there's specimens from this old mine in the Museum of Natural History there. Um, so that material means we didn't have to dig it up. There's no cost associated with that rock. I mean, there's processing costs, but no mining costs associated with that material. We've got other materials sitting on the ground that we've mined for the last three years. And that's much, much higher grade, much, much more economic. But the beautiful thing is for our first full year of production 2023, we get to deduct all that, all those expenses. So the irony is, is the more we spent over the last few years de-risking the project, we get the added benefit from an accounting standpoint to give us that extra free cash flow. So again, no, everyone's been focused on that construction risk, on the balance sheet risk, um, and now we get to finally talk about what's in front of us. And, and to come to a, for an operation for the next couple of years, um, to not have the same degree of pressure to get tonnage into that mill is fantastic. So I want to touch on, before we get to the Q&A, a little bit on the growth and, and sort of the next phase of the, of the company. But again, to, just one more time to look at that production profile on the next slide, Lindsay, is, is to look at the next few years in front of us. So if you look at those blue bars um, and, and you can look at that cumulative free cash flow over the first three years, that's a really nice stable platform to be looking at building a, a company. And again, these are all at lower cost or lower price assumptions than where we are today. So I kind of say it tongue in cheek to go back to that asymmetric, that if the market really gets ugly, um, the, the rest of the market, the broader market, the non-commodities market is trading at about two standard deviations above long-term averages. Uh, for anyone else who's heard this stat, more money went into the stock market last year than the last 19 years combined. I can tell you where that money didn't go. It didn't go to the mining sector, right? So our stock was down about 35% last year as everyone was afraid of the execution and money was going everywhere else except mining. So as things get really ugly, gold and silver tends to be the sector where you go for safety. So part of what I wanted to sort of articulate there that we've got the balance sheet safety, we've got a high grade asset, We've hopefully got a lot of risk management in place to, to give visibility to these cash flows. And then part of this, what do we do next, right? 
And a big part of that so far is we've only drilled about a third of the property. We've also bought another property that's about 80 kilometers away. And we spent, we spent $2 million on that. And, you know, hopefully we, it's come through on this to the understanding that if we've already built the infrastructure here, the amount of material that we would need to find at that other project is quite minimal for it to be economic because we don't need to build a new plant. We don't need to build a new facility. We need to buy some trucks and put the material on that truck and drive it over to this facility and put it in. So any of those economics and the value that we've articulated in those slides we've shown today is a moment in time. It's a snapshot. And the idea here for us to get to where we are quickly, about a third of the time as our, our traditional peer group, is to then look to what we can grow from there. And again, this company started with our exploration team, and I referenced that we have 95 million silver equivalent ounces. And our cost to find those ounces has been less than a dollar. Um, so again, now the point is, how many more ounces might we be able to find over the next few years? And the work that that exploration team did in 2021 was to de-risk that mine plan that we just showed. And it was in a work that was in addition to that mine plan that we just showed. And now that we've got those first three years stable and, and really locked down, not to, not to say there's no risk, that's basically four years of drilling, right? 2022 plus 2023 to 20, 2025. That's about four years of drilling that we get to add value to the company while shareholders hopefully get that added degree of risk, given the balance sheet, the quality of the asset and the resilience. So that's where I come back to that asymmetric dialogue, right? The sector itself is good protection when things are disruptive. The valuation of the sector relative to other sectors. Um, in Canada, it's the second worst performing sector. Uh, next to the cannabis space in 2021. So you've got this nice value base there. And then the drilling is something we're going to be doing quite a bit of over the next few years, trying to give growth option value. So to kind of wrap it up before we get into to, to Q&A, you know, again, just reiterating that this is a high quality, scarce resource in a really small sector, right? There's not many places to go if you're looking for high quality silver. We're fully financed. Right, that, that hopefully came through loud and clear that our balance sheet is strong and that we're near the end of construction today. That near-term cash flow, it's not really something we've been able to talk to because everyone's been focused on that construction, but it's now something that's coming very near-term. We hope to be pouring our first bar of gold in the second quarter this year. Silver, silver right now is in a typical ratio of gold to silver. It's about 80 to one in terms of price differential. And that's at one of the most extreme levels. And if you look at a chart over a hundred years, there's not many moments in time where it's been this extreme. So silver is again, a scarce resource, but it's trading at an even deeper discount to where gold is. So again, pretty unique time to be looking at silver. And again, hopefully that asymmetric risk reward has come through loud and clear. So I appreciate everyone's time. Happy to take some, some questions here. Um, and again, just getting through that big risky phase now is why we were really, um, Happy to get the opportunity to speak to this group today. Hey, Chris, Dan's back here. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, I got some questions that were sent to me, but before we get into that, I remind everybody, if you do have a question, uh, go to the bottom of your screen, click on the chat box, and you can type it in there. Uh, I know you got some pictures in your presentation here of you know where the mine was three or four months ago and where it is today. Can you quickly go through those pictures just to show Give us an idea of what the mine looks like right now. Absolutely. I mean, we'll run through a few of them. I mean, it's just to show that it's, it's well progressed. I mean, all the major pieces of equipment are on site right now. Um, the power line was a little delayed, so we went out and bought diesel generators. So they're all on site right now with the capacity to manage construction, ramp up, and production. Um, you know, here's our tanks uh, to have those in place. You can see that they're kind of coming to the, the final stages of being ready on that side of things. Um, you know, the bridge, um, this is a big, you know, issue in terms of just making sure safe transport over the river. This river does not look like this in the, in the rainy season. So again, having that in place is fantastic. Um, the tailings pond on the right here, um, 
you know, again, we have dry stack tailings. Uh, that's significant because some of the tailings ponds uh, risks have been a big issue uh, for insurance companies and whatnot. So we do not have that risk, which is fantastic. The power line, as discussed, uh, that is expected to be fully energized in the second quarter, but we do have a backup that's fully on site, ready to go with full capacity available to us. Um, so it's it's nice that things are finally coming together, that we can actually show some pretty pictures that, so maybe not pretty for others, but they are to us. Um, just to show that we are, this actually is turning into a mine. Yeah, it looks great, man. Uh, always good to see. I mean, we've looked at a lot of mining companies and like you said, it just takes them so long to get the mines online and, you know, a lot of them they'll sell out before they even get there. But, um, just to, I'll go through these questions. I think I send them over to you, but, uh, uh, we, I, I think you answered most of these already, but I see it. I see it. The price of silver dipped to 12. 20 early in the pandemic in March of 2020. Uh, then within like three or four months, I mean, it spiked all the way up to $30 an ounce in August of 2020. It has pulled back to about 2250, which is, you know, well above your, uh, you know, base case already. Uh, yep. I think you covered this, but what silver <laughs> price does Silvercrest need just to be, you know, cash flow positive? Did, did you say like nine or $10? Well, our, our operating costs in our study that we put out was sub seven, but by the time we get to 2020, 20, uh, 2023, it's two and a half years and there's been some cost pressures in the industry. So I do expect those to go up a little bit. Um, but if you show that slide that we spent some time on, on the production profile, it really shows the stress test uh, of that. So if you look at the, the FS downside number here, you'll see that at 1269 gold, and 1668 silver that we can pay back the capital on the project in 1.2 years and we'll still have about a hundred million of free cash flow so the break-even number is much much lower than that so for people who are really kind of thinking about the risk in the broader market like the s p last year was up 27 percent in the middle of a pandemic with disrupted supply chains so the fund flow and again, that, that market is two standard deviations above long-term averages, meaning, you know, the market has not been, has only been this expensive three times in the last hundred years. So I saw one of the questions just pop up into the chat about if you have limited funds and you know, why to think about this. I focus first and foremost on risk management. If things get really ugly in other stocks, other sectors, um, or even for us in precious metals, we are first and foremost trying to manage risk and be resilient at low levels. So I think that's that's not as sexy and not as fun to talk about, but I think it's important when things do get bad that we are going to be able to weather that storm. But at the same time, if you look at slightly higher commodity prices, it's a reasonable chance that we could be having a 15 to 20% free cash flow yield uh, for, for people who are also at the same time looking for protection against inflation. And that's been something that's been very topical in the near term. Yeah. Uh, can, can you uh, hedge uh, silver prices? And should you hedge silver prices? It, it, it's, it's a great question. And again, the industry average, the industry average cost to take it out of the ground is about 18 bucks. You know, for smaller producers, it's over 20. So mm -hmm. for those companies, yeah, it's important. You got to pay bills. Yeah. Uh, and again, you can go from an operating level there. So a lot of these companies need to sell their ounces to pay bills. Our cost profile, our balance sheet is our hedge, right? You know, right. we don't, you know, for, if we're going to be breaking even at less than $10 an ounce, we don't have those same pressures. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't, you know, so that's the beautiful thing. Like we can be flexibility or we can be flexible. So we, we could hedge if we wanted to um, but our view is that with inflation doing what it's doing and the fed about to raise rates and disruption coming in the market and our sector being at significant long-term lows uh, we don't want to hedge but we've got a business model that has that inherently built in so it's not done through being cavalier it's mm. thankfully within our structure yeah I, I i agree with you i think i honestly think we're in a commodity <laughs> super cycle I think this inflation is here to stay. You're seeing it, you know, in oil prices today at 92. Um, 
the only thing I would say on, on silver, can you do like in, in uh, oil and gas, they do cost as collars, they set a floor and they set a ceiling. Can you do that kind of a hedge in silver? Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, but thing. I think, I think one of the other interesting things to note is when you look at these costs for the industry being, you know, 18 plus and us being sub 10, um, one of the challenges is then your actual cost to go find it and explore it. Those aren't included, right? Our, our $1 per ounce uh, finding cost times 95 million uh, yeah, ounces, yeah. that's a hundred million dollars that actually isn't factored into those costs. So, you know, for the industry, um, right now, it's an industry that's not that sustainable for the higher cost operators. So what, what could happen is for a lot of people in the energy industry, they said, we're not going to, the investors don't want us to grow. They don't want us to go spend. They want us to harvest. And, and what that's caused is less growth, higher prices. Right. And right. what I think is going to happen in the mining right. sector is the exact same thing. People are looking at political risk. They're looking at inflationary costs. They're looking at the risks to get a mine up and running. And they're saying that's, that's a tough part of the cycle to be in full time. Um, we're not going to make these same investments. And I think what that means is supply goes way, way down. And I think what you might see over time is people actually just not selling some of their ounces and holding on. Yeah. So uh, I think, I think this is, there's <laughs> some really inherently strong dynamics. You, you can't turn on silver production overnight. If oil goes up, you know, 10 bucks a barrel tomorrow, there's a lot of people with rigs, you know, <laughs> that can get active pretty quickly. You just do not have that same supply response in mining as you do in energy. So I think, you know, the long-term, um, we've had 10 years of companies really paying down debt, getting healthy, showing discipline. And it, it's only now going to start to bleed through in terms of pricing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, let's get to the political questions here. There's <laughs> one that says, how is the political and regulatory environment where you are drilling? And I know that some copper mines in Chile and Peru, Peru face potential higher taxes or royalties owed mm -hmm. to the government. So uh, how do you factor in your politics? Uh, you know, how supportive really is the Mexican government these days? Sure. Uh, we've been in Mexico for about 17 years. Uh, the last mine we built was 25 kilometers away. So we've been there for quite some time and have a good understanding of that. Our country manager is a fourth generation rancher in the community. We've got about 20, 200 head of cattle ourselves. This is a ranching community. Um, mining is the highest paying wage industry in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually have a National Miners Day, so it's actually a celebrated industry. Um, we're in a rural community of 2,800 people, so this is a, a big boost to the local economy. Some of the projects we're doing right now, there's some headlines out of Chile today. They're talking about massive uh, revoking water permits, um, which is a massive issue. Water scarcity is becoming a big, big challenge. Uh, we did a bunch of work this year that's going to be coming out in the next uh, six months or so where we're gonna fix all of the water infrastructure in our community. And what this translates to is the community is currently using 2,100 liters per second of water. Once we're done with these, this five year project that we're gonna outline, uh, fixing the aqueducts and the valves from the river to the aqueducts and the sewage systems, we're gonna save them 1,700 liters per second. And to put that in context, the mine itself, when it's up and running, is only going to use 11 liters per second. So one of the biggest things we're doing for this community is we're having them apply for water concessions. We're going to do that work for them. We're paying for these projects. It's going to be about a million and a half dollars over five years, not our tax dollars, right? If the governments want to take credit for some of this work, we'll let them do that and we'll support them in doing that. They don't want people moving from the country to the city. It's more costly to do that, but they need the local infrastructure to be resilient enough and they need the local opportunities to be enough for people to stick around. So a lot of our work on the ESG side is going to be supportive of the infrastructure, of the water, the economic resilience in these communities. And not only is that for local community support, but it's for broader based political support. So we're doing that for political risk. We're doing that for community support. And we're doing that to be good, good corporate citizens. Um, and we want to be welcome into these communities, right? And we want to do that as a means to be welcomed into future communities as we, as we decide where to be doing our next, uh, you know, next wave of growth. And we believe that's important. And if you can be leaving a community better than when you showed up, um, they're going to want you there, yeah, right? So I think true. for us, we see that as an opportunity and not a risk. How, how many people are going to be working at the mine? 
think right now we have in the neighborhood of eight, 900 during construction wow. and we're wow. fully up and running. We'll be in the four 500 uh, range. And the, the town itself has 2,800 people. So when COVID's over and we can get back into the community, there's a big, uh, a big boost that can happen in terms of renting homes, eating at restaurants. There's 20 local businesses that we currently uh, do business with. So we're a big part of this community and, and we're happy to be there. Great. Um, okay. Um, how, how is a production sold to so your, you get this ore, you process it. And, and so then you uh, get it down into bars or something. And then those have to be further processed, right? Yeah, we've got 55% silver, 45 gold. At the end of the day, we'll produce a big bar. Um, and then that bar is gold and silver. And people come and pick it up. And we take it to the refinery. They process it and they remove that last little bit of impurities that, um, that are in there. And they separate out the gold and the silver and they take it to that 99.9999% purity level. Uh -huh. um, and then we retain ownership during that process. And then we decide what to do with it from there. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I was wondering if you just sold it as it when it left the mine, but you actually retain ownership all the way until we could. Period. I mean, some companies sell it forward. Some people hedge it. Some people sell it to the refinery itself and, yeah. and whatnot. So like, these are things, again, when we're deciding, you know, where we see pricing going and whatnot. Cause I mean, again, over time, people are going to have hundreds of millions of dollars on their balance sheet. Our first three years of free cash flow could be over 250 million. Wow. So part wow. of our story is are people investing in gold and silver? Or are they investing in us holding more U S dollars? Yeah. So I think, I think these are some of the, the issues where people, people want exposure to the gold and silver. So, you know, that's one of the things we can do via growth of more, but also just the mind plan we have today. So you could, you could, uh, let's say this thing gets up and running, it's free cash flow. You got a lot of extra cash. Uh, you know, you'll have some to do that expiration in those nearby um, areas to develop, uh, to bring on more resources. Uh, could you be paying a dividend or, it, it, I mean, is your plan to just keep operating the mine or do you, you see yourself selling it, you think? Um, well, all, all options are on the table. I mean, the previous Silvercrest, like I said, part of the real value add of that resilience was be the last man standing. Right. And if, if, if people come and they need us desperately because of our resilience and our strength and the quality of the asset, we're going to make sure we get good value for that. So if the, then the cycle turns and commodity prices go up, um, our shareholders can participate in that in the new vehicle if someone buys us. If other people are really struggling and it's a good asset and they don't have money or they don't have the high quality team of our exploration team or our construction operations team, we can go buy them. Right. So we want to be able to be opportunistic throughout the cycle. And the main way we have the ability to do that is because we have an asset that can be highly profitable throughout cycles. If you're not profitable and you're, you don't have a good balance sheet and the, and the market's on its knees, you're on, the, on your knees with it. So, yeah. you know, you want you, you want to be able to be opportunistic at the right time. So that could be a dividend that could be buying assets that could be selling the company. Uh, but the beautiful things is, is we want to be in the driver's seat. We think we can be with the quality of this asset. Yeah. Every, everything's for sale at the right price. Right. Yep. <laughs> I was, yeah. at, I worked, I worked for Hess, which we had big operations sure. in, in Canada for a while. I was actually in our New York office when somebody <laughs> walked in and asked to speak to John Hess, the CEO. And he made an offer for everything we had in Canada. That was about 50% higher than what we thought it was worth. It took us about two hours to say sold <laughs> right up the papers. I think so. so. We, we sold all of Canada for $300 million. I remember anyway. So you got a couple of your uh, shareholders that have written comments here. I ought to read them so that the people can hear sure. what it says. I've been following this project company for a couple of years, exceptional project uh, purchase of the diesel generators to assure electricity uh, power supply was an important step to de-risk the operation. So you can, you know, actually get the mine open in a few months uh, dealing with the CFE. What's the yep. CFE? That's the, it, that's the Mexican regular or the power. Uh, no, power company. So okay. Okay. Yeah, it's, I, it's their pipe. It's their power line. We pay for it and basically give it back to them. But I mean, we, we need to make sure we get the power and we don't need to work on their timelines. So that's yeah. why we kind of stepped into to mitigate that risk and the, the full, full kudos to, uh, to Pierre and the operations team for that decision. 
Yeah. When we lost power here about a year ago <laughs> for yeah. three or four days in Texas, I, I can tell you one, uh, the uh, home generator business went through the roof. <laughs> anyway, another guy, yeah, another guy said, I just wanted to say that I have been an investor in Silvercrest stock since 2018. And I'm very happy with the decision to buy the stock. That's good. Uh, then we got one more question it says, are there any other satellite deposits like what's Picacho. El Picacho that you are looking at. And it these are my question. You know, what's the yep. what's the real expiration upside, I guess, in that area? And you're looking like within a what a 50 or 100 mile radius of the of the mill? It just depends on the economics. Like it, it all comes down to economics per ton. And you know, the cost to trucking those those tons is, is part of that economic decision. If it's 200 kilometers away, but the, the ore is amazing and, and there's math to do, right? Mm -hmm. Um so, you know, El Picacho, it's, it's a $2 million decision. I mean, like, you know, and, and the idea being, again, if there's no infrastructure to build, uh, we just have to find enough critical mass there to make the fixed costs associated with digging it up uh, sense. And it's still very, very early days. And we're not at that critical mass by any extent right now. That's just the strategy, right? So again, part of that rush to get uh, into production early was to give us that view. And part of us spending 2021 to sort of lock down those first few years of cash flow is to give us that time. So will we look at all sorts of other satellite deposits? Absolutely. And that's where we're back to square one in terms of the drilling. About 80% of the drilling in the last year was, last three years, was infill drilling, building the confidence around the mine plan to get the cash flow. Now we get to have fun and go back to looking at the other veins, not only at Las Chispas, at Picacho, but looking at other properties in the neighborhood. And something at a 50 kilometers away for a new entrant to come to that community, their threshold for success is it has to be big enough to build a plant. It has to be build it big enough to have profitability above and beyond that additional capital required. So the competitive advantage we have at looking at any of these process properties is massive because our threshold is so much lower. Mm -hmm. So as you, again, go back to the risk reward of a company like this, that risk on the front end to take a $5 million purchase to turn it into a mine, let alone a world-class mine, then building it and getting to the finish line in, in, in a really tough market like we have and to have excess capital. Um, now to get to that point of how do we leverage that infrastructure? How do we leverage that balance sheet? How do we take advantage of our, uh, of our low cost structure and be more resilient? These are all the sort of go forward opportunities that we're, finally getting a chance to breathe and, and spend time on after all the hard work of, of getting us to where we are today. Well, this, I know this is an exciting time for you guys because I've been involved in oil and gas business for a long time. And we had some, you know, offshore projects that took years, you know, from discovery to get them online took years. And we were so excited, you know, to have that come on for us. So um, my, one last question for me, this just shows how ignorant I am of the metals market, but uh, other than jewelry and people putting, you know, silver coins in their de uh, deposit box, uh, what's the industrial demand for silver? Sure. So about 60% of silver is consumed on an annual basis. Uh, and the market's really small. It's about a billion ounces a year. So if you do your math, you know, $23 an ounce times 400 million ounces, it's a really tiny market. So I, mm -hmm. I make that point as it relates to if there is incremental interest in the in the sector from an investment standpoint, inflation, whatnot, uh, it doesn't take much capital to really move it. Um, the other 60%, uh, part of it, a, a big chunk of it's conductivity and photovoltaic. So it's a big component in solar panels. So this energy transition conversation that's taking place, um, a big component of that is silver. So it is part of the green energy transition that people are talking about. Uh, and again, conductivity, that's a big part of it. And, and another aspect is antimicrobial, so infection and, and things like that. So it's, it's a really important uh, metal. Um, and again, the supply side is, is not growing. So it, it's something where, yeah, a lot of it's consumed. And if you think about it from a monetary standpoint, I mean, it was kind of thinking of it as like a, you know, you got your $100 bills and then you got your $1 bill. Silver was the $1 bill sort of thing. It was like a lower <laughs> denominated form of currency here. So um, it's, it's consumed heavily. And again, because there's been a lack of investment for the last decade, the supply and demand itself is going to be quite interesting in the next uh, you know, while to come.
Yeah. And I think, you know, we're going to see more and more of those commercials with inflation that, you know, people should be putting their IRA money into gold and silver. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this, I believe this inflation is here to stay for quite a while. We've been printing money down here in the U S and, uh, it's going to devalue the currency at some point. I read, I read a book recently and they had a bunch of stats in, and they, one of the stats was, this is just factual. If you take the top 10 strongest currencies in the world from 1960 to 2015, that the annual supply growth of the currency itself was over 11% per year. So, yeah. and that's pre-pandemic. So if we're increasing the supply of currency at an alarming rate for the, for the healthiest of currencies, uh, what does that say to the, the value of your savings in your IRA? Yeah. So yeah. part of this conversation is it's not sexy, it's not fun, but there's never been a paper currency that's ever survived. That's right. Uh, and That's if you right. want to read Ray Dalio's new book, it, it really speaks to cycles, long-term cycles and what these trends look like. And it, the unfortunate conclusion is that he believes the U.S. is about 70 percent through their their current cycle right now. And, and part of that challenge is the 51 percent of all global transactions are, are denominated in U.S. dollars. Um, a, a few while ago, it was 58. And before that, it was 72. So if the U.S. is printing aggressively and the world's not there to nece necessarily absorb all of those dollars, there's some challenges in, in the value of that currency. So it is something for people to be aware of, and it's not a fun thought, um, but this is where gold and silver has relevancy. Well, if I was the king, I'd make uh, people have to uh, pass a um, simple economic quiz before they could vote. <laughs> because we are making some bad decisions on the people we put into power these days. So, yeah, anyway. like I said, they're not great conversations when it comes to some of the realities of uh, and it's if it was that easy to print money and have everybody have their stock portfolios go up and their houses go up. Uh, the, the unfortunate reality is the bottom half of this, the, the demographic, yeah. socioeconomic right. demographic are not participating in this, uh, in this boom, right? So it's, yeah. it's, yeah. Uh, it's if it was that easy, we would have done this a long time ago in printing money. Well, you guys have, uh, you've come a long way. I, I think the timing on this one is great. Um, we have recorded this. <laughs> We're going to send it out to our global membership. It'll go out to three or 400 people this afternoon. Of course, they're not supposed to share it, but they'll share it. We've actually had uh, up to 5,000 views on some of our, our webinars. So uh, Amazing. If, if the word silver is in the, uh, the title, it'll get a lot of hits. I'll tell you that. So anyway, Chris, thanks a lot. And Sabrina, why don't we end it here? And then we'll... Uh, We'll clean the thing up the front and the end, and then we'll send this out this afternoon. Thanks a lot. Appreciate everyone's time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.